Greetings one and all, Super Mondays here in the Holy Land, the Holy Apple, the Holy Hilltop, Tal Binyamin, 18th day of Elul, 5783, as the clock is ticking towards the end of 5783. Today, second part of our class the amazing class information that Hashem has sent to us. OMG, oh my gosh, they spat on my church. Part two, we could add a subtitle of it. Can Christians repent? Subtitle of the class, can Christians repent? repent. Put on a seat belt once again. Get these classes out. They're extremely fundamental. And today, even the most fundamental ideas have been lost to the masses, unfortunately. Okay. Last week, last Monday, we went on a journey through history, 400 years of Jewish history from 1096 to 1492. Uh, we went through the Crusades, we went through the uh, the Black Plague, we went through uh, poisoning wells, we went through blood, blood libels, uh, inquisitions, uh, forced conversions, you name it, we've been through it. Okay, now we're going to Take a step back and how do we view these various uh, meetings that sometimes Jews have with Christians in front of their churches, at demonstrations? How does the Jewish eye look at such confrontations between us? and the Christian people. So let's delve into it right away with Hashem's help. This was maybe three years ago, four years ago. I think our cameraman Svi might even have been there. We, a Jew was murdered about nine kilometers from here in Ariel at the intersection, the Ariel intersection, as is our custom, in order that Jews should not be afraid, in order that Jews not be afraid to stand at hitching posts, we try to go down uh, <clears throat> where the murder took place and film a class. We're not going to be frightened off by the Arab terrorists. After the class that I gave at that intersection, a group of Christians approached me. There are many Christians, unfortunately, in the city of Ariel. That could be a whole class in itself, the connection. Of course, it's a money connection between Ariel, uh, the former mayor of Ariel, um, and the Christian community, there is a Christian Bible center, sports center that uh, exists bringing Jewish youths and teaching them uh, Tanakh stories. So lovely. So, there's a hotel right at the intersection, many Christian tourist groups stay at that hotel. So a group of Christians approached me and they asked forgiveness for Christian behavior. And I quoted to them a tractate in the Talmud, tractate Rosh Hashanah, 12 days from now, 
page 23, side A. A person who steals copper can atone by bringing gold to the victim, to the victims. One that stole metal from a Jew can atone by bringing silver. However, for killing Rabbi Akiva and his peers, there is no atonement. You burn down a Jewish community, you could build it up. You burn down a synagogue, you could rebuild it. For the murder of Jews, one, not talking about millions, who knows, perhaps billions of Jews in the last 1600 plus years. There is no atonement. I looked him straight in the eye, told him no forgiveness. Rabbi Yochanan concluding in our tractate of Rosh Hashanah, 23a. Woe to the nations! Behold the fate of the nations that have no way to atone for the murder of Jews. Rashi, the giant commentator who lived in France during the first crusade, Rashi comments on this statement of Rabbi Yochanan. Rashi does not write, Woe to the nations that have killed Rabbi Akiva and his peers. He says the blood of Israel, regular folk, regular Jews, it was an example. Rabbi Akiva and his peers. It's an example. But we're talking about any Jew. Look up the Marsha. The Marsha writes the exact same idea. Talking about your average bear Jew. Rabbi Yonatan Apeshitz in his classic work, Yarod Devash, first volume, 11th speech, 1-1, one, one, writes, If you notice, atonement for the Gentile world, those that stole Jewish possessions, are always one or two degrees higher. We said, if one stole copper from Jews or communities, they must atone through building, rebuilding the community with gold. Or if, if Gentiles stole uh, metal, they must atone with silver. Always have to go one step higher. You can't just do a tit for a tat. Listen to the words. Engrave them on all our souls of Rav Yonatan Apeshitz, who lived in the mid-1600s. So too, even if Gentiles killed wicked Jews, those Jews, wicked Jews, will be judged 
those, those Gentiles will be judged as if they killed a righteous scholar like Rabbi Akiva. Listen to those words, rewind one more time. We're talking about wicked Jews. Blow off the religion. A Gentile kills those wicked Jews, scoffers, as if they killed righteous Jews, Rabbi Akiva and other, other Jewish giants. Why is that, Rabbi Yonatan Evshitz? He tells us. As who knows what would have happened with this wicked Jew if the Gentiles did not murder him? What could have become of him? Rabbi Akiva was not Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva for 40 years, he despised the sages. Shlomo Karbach has a great line, you never know. So, Rav Yonatan Evshitz hits it out of the park. Tomer Dvora, the ball is still traveling. Till this day, till this second. It's still going. Because we do not know what could have become of this wicked Jew. He is considered to be a righteous Jew. And the Gentiles will be responsible for murdering righteous Jews. Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu, Zechot Tzadik Livacha, righteous memory. When he eulogized my rabbi for 10 years, I sat in Rabbi Binyamin Herling, Zechot Tzadik Livracha, for 10 years, I sat in the Talmud class in Elon Moreshchem of Rabbi, the saintly Rabbi. Can't use that word, right? Remember from the first class. Yeah, got to throw those words out. Yeah, they're not too saintly, those Christians. So, in his eulogy, the chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi the former, Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu, Eulogizing Rabbi Binyamin Herling in the book, Ishi Mincha, page 442, look it up. He explains this Talmud verse similar to Rabbi Yonatan Evshitz. However, he adds on, God holds the Gentiles accountable for all the Torah, for all the students, for all the children that the murdered soul could have brought into the world if not for the fact that they were murdered. Gentiles murdered a single, a kid. They are judged for killing, not a kid, a person, a Torah giant with 10 kids, 15 kids, students, thousands of students. Rabbi Moshe Klein of B'nai Brak, a contemporary, in his amazing book, Questions on Life, page 619, points out an amazing detail that we might have missed on this verse in the Talmud Rosh Hashanah 23a. Notice, says Rabbi Klein, the Talmud, after discussing the murder of Rabbi Akiva and his peers, concludes with the words of Rabbi Yochanan, Woe to the nations that have no way to fix or atone for the murder of Rabbi Akiva and peers. Notice the Talmud does not say, Woe to the perpetrators! How many people actually killed Rabbi Akiva? How many people actually kill other Jews? A couple of people. 
Sometimes it's, it might be hundreds of people. Sometimes it might be one person. Whatever it might be. It doesn't say woe to the perpetrators. It says woe to the nations. Not the ones that pulled the trigger, necessarily. I mean, of course, them who pulled the trigger. But woe to the nations! For all generations, there is no forgiveness, there is no forgiving, there is no forgetting. All are responsible. There's a certain essence of the Christian world. There's a certain DNA that passes. That today they come with love. And they come and they donate a lot of money thinking they could buy Jews. Well, let me tell you something. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. And there's a lot of religious Jews that you don't fool one bit. Your DNA, you are responsible for all generations, for all the Jewish blood that was spilled in the name of JC, in the name of the cross, in the name of Christianity. And let me tell you why today you're responsible. Very simply, we have an amazing line that we read two weeks ago in the portion Deuteronomy Kiteitse on 23rd chapter, verse 9. Rashi bringing down the words of the Sifri on this portion of Kitetse, Rashi bringing the words of the Tanchuma on this portion, notes an amazing, something very confusing. On one hand, it tells us that Egyptians or Edomites that want to convert, they cannot marry a Jewish person till three generations pass. They are allowed to convert, but they are not allowed to marry within the Jewish community. They would they have to marry converts. Three generations. On the other hand, the nations of Moab, the nation of Ammon, even if they convert the males, they are never allowed to marry a Jewish, 100% born Israel, Israeli, so to speak, Jew. They will have to marry converts. Why is that? And Rashi the greatest of all commentators, bringing the words of our sages in here. An amazing concept of Judaism. You know why? It's true the Egyptians killed Jewish babies. It's true that the Egyptians killed Jews over a period of 210 years, that the Jews were slaves. True. It is true that Edom it is true that Edom came with swords so that the Jewish people would not tre trespass and go through their land, which they had, re they had requested to be able to pass by. They came out with the sword. And they're allowed, after three generations, what was so bad about, about Ammon and Moab? 
an amazing Jewish concept. Engrave this on your heart. Gadol amachti yoter min haoreg. In Judaism's ideology, a person who brings those to sin is a million times worse than a person who brings, than a person who goes out and kills a Jew. Because a person that goes out and kills a Jew, the Jew loses this world, but not the next world. A Jew who is who is convinced, influenced, coerced to sin, they lose both worlds, this world and the next world to come. That is Jewish ideology. Much, much worse to cause somebody to sin, to cause someone to stray from the straight and righteous path. So let me tell you, if there are any Christian listeners out there, and you better be listening, you continue today your holy mission. Can't fool us. Your holy mission is to convert Jews, to bring them to sin. Jews that jumped into fires, Jews that killed themselves rather than convert. Those, those smart Christians who lift up their hands, we are not missionaries. They are connected to organizations that missionize. Oh, what a beautiful, what a beautiful trick there. We do not missionize Jews. That might be so, it might not be so. We won't give you the benefit of the doubt. But they're connected to organizations who have an obsession to convert Jews. So that is Rabbi Yochanan's words to you. True. Since the, since the 400 years that we talked about, that's just the 400 years, we could go on here for weeks and talk about Christian history with the Jews. Woe to you, Christians. Remember that song in Rocky, maybe it was six? There's no shortcuts home. There's no easy way out. Remember that song? That was a good one. That is the lesson for you. If you do not become a Gentile of Noah with the seven commandments of Noah, which are really about 70 commandments of Noah, you continue. You continue. You have the hunters and the fish. All of you are hunters. Unless you take the seven accept the seven and go to heaven. Ever hear the famous rabbi, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Bardichev, he had a guest at his house and his wife said, would you like a piece of fish as is a custom for Jews on Friday nights to eat fish? And the, the guest responded, I love fish. Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, when he heard the words, I love fish, he was so freaked, he was so, he was so astonished, he just threw up all of the, the whole plate of fish to the ceiling, all over the floor. I love fish. To continue that story of Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, a fisherman, a hunter, as you are Christians, you're the hunters, you know what I'm talking about. 
You don't love fish. You love yourself. And in order to satisfy yourself, you got to give some breadcrumbs, some worms to them fish. Yeah, you got to pay a little bit of a price, but your goal is to catch that fish. The hunters! Yeah, you might put a, put a nice piece of meat into a trap, but you don't love animals, you love yourself. And you're trying to capture animals. And therefore, in order to capture them, there's a price, a bait. That is exactly who you are. Look in the mirror. Christian world, look in the mirror. That's who you are. And therefore, there is no forgetting. There is no forgiveness. There is no atonement here. You could keep that money, shove it. Can a Gentile repent? Forgetting now all the crusades, pogroms, inquisitions, blood libels, expulsions, you name it, poisoning of the wells. Hashem had kindness on me. He allowed me to give two or three classes on that subject some years ago. Without promising, I will, in the comment section, put a link to those two or three classes. Can a Gentile repent? The answer to this question is no. This is based on our sages' words in Tanhuma, portion of Hazinu, paragraph number four. I hear I hear voices saying, Brother Yehuda, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be, in three weeks, we're going to be celebrating Yom Kippur, and there we read about the Jewish prophet Jonah, who goes, who's supposed to be going to Nineveh, the Gentile city, and to try to tell them to repent. So what are you what were your classes about? You gave two classes on the subject, three classes? It seems like a contradiction. But it's not. It's not. I will summarize. There are many answers to this. I'll summarize a few answers. Number one. The story of Nineveh. When Jonah with the whale. Nineveh was an exception to the rule. The rule is that Gentiles cannot repent. That is the rule. Sometimes to every rule there's an exception. Nineveh was that exception to the rule. Why? Because their roots, their early roots, the founder of Nineveh, his name was Ashur, when he saw the evil king, Nimrod, he was leading people astray, away from the path of righteousness, away from the path of God. He said, I will not raise a family, I will not remain in the midst of these wicked people, I must leave. Ashur, he got up and he left. It's not easy taking your bags, picking them up and leaving to a new place. All beginnings are difficult, our sages tell us how true. Look that up, Genesis chapter 10, verse 11. Therefore, as an exception to the rule, because tremendous self-sacrifice of this Gentile, Ashur, his descendants, hundreds of years later, were given an opportunity to repent. Two. This is a very interesting distinction. When Gentiles sin amongst themselves, they can repent. When Gentiles hurt 
the Jewish people, there is no repentance. Once again, between Gentiles, a Gentile damaged, a Gentile whatever caused another Gentile suffering, there people can repent. However, what the Gentiles do to the Jewish people, the sorrow that they have for almost 2,000 years, what they have done to the Jewish people, suffering at their hands, there is no forgiveness. Therefore, the Radak, the famous commentator, the Radak comments that if you look in the book of Jonah, you'll see that they had no connection to the Jewish people. They did not harm in any fashion or manner the Jewish people. It was all amongst themselves. They were evil amongst themselves, therefore they were allowed. However, if you look in another prophet, the prophet of Nahum, at the beginning, the Radak, the commentator of the Radak, brings down this idea. Here, these people of Nineveh, they, they instigated against the Jewish people. They attacked the Jewish people. Therefore, in the time of the prophet Nahum, Ninve was destroyed because of the suffering that they caused to the Jewish people. An amazing take. More sources. How was Ninve? So, so far we have how was Ninve allowed to repent? Because of the fact that they did not sin against the Jewish people. They sinned amongst themselves. One. Number two. Uh, these are brought down by the Ramav, the Ramav Pano. 120,000 people together repented in the time of Jonah and the time of the Gentile community of Nineveh. When you have such a massive repentance, 120,000 people, that's amazing. You could be an exception to the rule. Number two. Not only, they didn't do an average bare repentance. You know, some, some people spend a couple of minutes and they think they repented. They were extremely serious with their repentance. In fact, they got the animals involved. They put sackcloth on the animals. In fact, if they stole something, they would not just give money back. They would, they would destroy whatever uh, they had built with stolen materials and they gave also the materials back to the uh, legal owners so it was also they also uh, paid a penalty and also they gave them all the materials back amazing so a very very severe serious type of repentance here not your average bear and number three according to the Ramav Pano the, there, a, in Nineveh, a Gentile is a la God temporarily accepts their repentance. And that is good for a certain time to put off the decree. You know, like we all, uh, when I get a ticket on my car, I try to wait till the last day to pay it. You know, wait three months. <laughs> so you wait till the last. So God puts off punishment if the Gentiles in Nineveh will repent, but we see shortly after that, I think it was uh, perhaps even a, even less than a year, the, the city of Nineveh was destroyed in the time of Nahum, the prophet. So it's a temporary putting off the decree type of situation. Is there any source, are there any sources for spitting on churches? Okay, in the end of our prayers, three times a day, if you're Yemenite, then two times a day, we say the Aleinu Lishabeach prayer. And we say a line, there are many people that live outside of Israel that are not familiar with this line, because it was censored 
for 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 millennia, it was censored from the Jewish prayer books. When I was a kid, I never was not familiar with this line. Uh, anyways, it says Shehem Yishtachavim Lahevel Vilarik, which means they prostrate themselves before those that are void and empty. And that line was taken away because the Christians would pogrom against the Jewish people when they saw this. When they saw the lines, they claimed that this was a line against JC. So let's look if there are any sources to this uh, spinning. Sometimes today you could go to various communities um, and you will see some kind of motion of a person. Uh, it looks like they might be spitting, but at least a motion of a spitting. You'll see this in some various Jewish communities until today. So let's look if there's any source to this. The famous student of Rashi, his name was Shimon Vitri, in his Machzor Vitri, in the year 1100, page 655, he brings down the two words, Lahevel Varik, void and empty. This is the numerical value of Jesus and Muhammad. Once again, Lahevel Varik, take out your calculators and do it. Uh, you have J.C. and Mohammed. In the book, Arugat HaBosem, by Rabbi Avram Azriel, in the year 1234, writes, I have heard that when you pray, you should say the words, Vehevel Varik, void and empty, this is the numerical value, the gematria, of Yeshu and Mahmad, Muhammad. If you listen to the word varik, it is very similar to the word of, in Hebrew, rok, which means mucus, or spitting. The maharil in the year 1427, writes in his book, The Customs of the Me'aril, on page 297, during uh, uh, page 297 is prayers for the Rosh Hashanah. He writes there, when we say the famous prayer, Aleinu Lishabeach, which has this line in it, one should spit one time. The famous a uh, Jewish law commentator, the Taz, Rabbi David Sego. He lived in 1586 in the Code of Jewish Law, Yoradea, 179, Law 5, agrees with the opinion of the Maril to make a motion of spitting when one says, Vahevel Varik. Many other sources agreed with this. The Kemach Solet, Dat Torah, Minhagi Shurun, and others. The Shlaha Kadosh, however, advised not to do this custom because of the dangers involved, i.e., the Christian world. In the book Mea Sharim Vishkunatea, the in a book entitled A Neighborhood Called Mea Sharim and Neighborhoods Nearby, on page 492. Listen to this. This was a wide custom, wide range custom, for generations. When Jews would travel in the old city of Jerusalem, they would continue reciting the verse, Deuteronomy 726, I read to you. Do not bring any offensive idols into your house, since you may become just like it. Shun it totally, and consider it absolutely offensive, since it is taboo. Listen to this. In this book, Mea Sharim and its neighboring 
communities. Jews for generations would go in the old city, and when they passed place of Christian worshiping, they would say this verse in Hebrew, whatever the language they spoke, and some adding a spit. When I was uh, when I was a kid in the hood, in the hood, we would say hakalugi. If any of you remember, maybe they use it still. In the book, in the book called The Community of Sosnovich, Sosnovich, on page, also page 492, in the villages of Dindovka and Mandaju, there were no churches. However, in Nivka, there was one church, and every time we passed by, we would spit, and we would say the verse in Deuteronomy 7.26. So we see the Maharil, we see the Taz, we see the Machzor Vitri, we see uh, Kemach Solit and others that bring down to, some bring down to say this verse and have in mind, some bring down to add a spit to it. In the Jewish law book, Piske Chuvus, in the Code of Jewish Law, Aruch Chaim, Orachaim, in chapter 224, in the Orachaim, I summarize, first law, one should make fun and look in disgust regarding all types of idol worshipping. Two, one should keep a distance of six and a half feet or two meters for those that go by meters and not stare at places of idol worshiping three when one passes such a place they should say the following verse Deuteronomy 7 26 for the Ramah the Jewish uh, law codifier in your Adea 150 Law 2 adds, the law of despising idol worshiping includes clergymen with crosses on their garments. Remember our famous abbot? Can you shove your cross down your shirt? She said it very politely. So we see in the Jewish law books, Piske Chuvis that is what is written folks the Christians should be thanking 24 7 thanking the dear Lord the real Lord that the Jews are just demonstrating that the Jews maybe sometimes spit and the Jews maybe say a verse in Deuteronomy be very very thankful 24 7 what's coming your way thousands of years of destruction tragedy violence against the Jewish people and it continues today even worse than the killing of Jews, the blood libels, the crusades, the inquisitions, poison wells, you name it, is your continued trying to missionize world Jewry. There is no repentance for you.